Number five, the Lurlian Hydra. I'm no Hercules per se. Yeah, nothing. But thankfully, actually, because those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because that dude had to be brave beyond just like deep breaths and good pep talks. Guy had to literally fight like a 10 story condo building. How does one dude equipped with a club and a sword kill a 10 story building with teeth and three heads? Well, five heads. Well, 10 heads. Depending on how many you cut off, I guess. I guess that's why his name will be remembered and mine will be lost at sea. I guess he was a demigod, half powerful, half regular. A little unfair. By the way, which Hercules did you grow up on? I I grew up on the Disney version and Kevin Sorbo. Ugh, oh, what a hunk. But there's been a lot, including the ancient real guy. She's known as simply the Hydra. As a serpentine water monster in Greek and Roman mythology, it's terrifying. Its lair was at the Lake of Lerna, also known to be the entrance of the underworld. Yikes. In the myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, Hercules, as the second of his 12 labors. Okay, so this guy did it and then went on to go and do like 10 more. 10 and 0. Like, how hard can it be, right? I mean, it does have multiple heads. Yeah, it does have that. Also, apparently has poisonous breath and blood so violent that uh, its scent is even deadly. Later versions of the Hydra story added regeneration to the monster's abilities too, so it can just start growing heads back at will. For every head chopped off, the Hydra would regrow two heads. So every time the Meg bites a head, two more. Another two are growing, yeah. Good thing this thing was hungry and swallows whales whole because uh, that's gonna be a lot of protein. Number four, Jormungandr. Keeping it in the mythology department, we head up a little north. Jormungandr, AKA huge monster. Also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent. It is a sea serpent and the middle child of Loki and giantess Angraboda. And those middle children, huh? Always the problem, kids. I would know. I am one. According to the prose Edda, Odin took Loki's three children by Angraboda, Fenrir, Hel, and Jormungandr, and tossed Jormungandr into the great ocean. The serpent grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp it in its own tail, as it's referred to as, well, the World Serpent. And apparently, when it releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin. Yeah, basically a destruction to the end of the world. Yeah, all this rich history is so heavy and gloomy, isn't it? Isn't there like a, the sun will shine like California for all to enjoy? Like, where's that written down? Nowhere, huh? Just cataclysms and monsters. Jormungandr's arch enemy is the thunder god, Thor. And apparently, a megalodon too. Cause let's face it, a giant serpent versus a four story great white, it would definitely be a good fight. I think if Thor showed up and started smashing up both, it would literally be the best Marvel Universe movie yet. Another encounter comes when Thor goes fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, he strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use as his bait. Okay, easy, Roid Rage. Sheesh. They row to a point where Hymir fishes, he prepares his fishing line and a large hook and baits it with the ox head, which Jormungandr bites. Thor then yanks the serpent up from the water and the two throw hands. Okay, so it sounds like it isn't that big. I mean, it's huge, but the wrapping around the planet has got my dimensions off. Maybe it was like a metric versus imperial thing back then. I don't know, what do you think? Comment down below who would win because when it gets into mystical powers and stuff, it becomes a little unfairly matched, no? Number three, Cthulhu. Come on, we know this guy. Now this would be a good fight. This is sort of fathomable. Well, kinda. An extinct shark versus a made up ender of worlds. Cool, let's do that. Basically a giant humanoid octopus dragon versus the Carcharasless Megalodon, a triplex size apex predator. It's definitely gonna be in Vegas and pay-per-view. I'll tell you that for free. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic horror entity thought up by the twisted mind of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. First introduced in his short story called the Call of Cthulhu, published by the American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928. He's like the first creature Lovecraft pondered up. He's terrifying. He's supposed to bring Armageddon upon us when he wakes up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, again, not all sunshine and rainbows with these stories. Actually, like, ever with these stories. Cthulhu is a great old one, almost the god of all gods in these stories. All these characters intertwine and apparently he's our last call. Lovecraft depicts it as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists in the shape of a green octopus, dragon, humanoid, bipedal creature. And it's like 10 stories high. Yeah, like massive. Like us looking at toy army men. The Lovecraft universe, aka the Cthulhu mythos, its appearance alone is enough to haunt your dreams. Lovecraft describes this guy as a face full of octopus-like feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, sharp claws on its hands and feet, and of course, dragon's wings. So it can fly and swim. In other words, the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah, Cthulhu can fly, which he has on the Meg for sure. 
And also, the mind control. I don't know how Shark's brains works, but Cthulhu gets in there. Yeah, you're in trouble, Sharky. Number two, the Leviathan. Okay, so we're diving into some very sacred text now. The Bible. In said pieces of scripture, there's a tale of a giant creature that could swallow up cities, apparently, and is also an awesome roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Gotta try it if you haven't been on it yet. This twisty, turny, vicious monster was actually modeled after this twisty, turny, vicious monster. The Leviathan. The second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute unit of a sea monster who's impervious to literally any human weapon. I mean, what were the weapons back then though? Like bows and arrows, swords maybe, little pokey things, you know? It's not gonna do much. Apparently locusts too, yeah, those are terrifying. This Leviathan breathes fire. It emits smoke from its nostrils and it's related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who's represented as pure chaos. I mean, what Bible creature isn't terrifying though? Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Cause apparently it's something like 300 miles long according to the Bible. So it's like Jormungandr territory, but longer. Maybe it's the same creature told by two different peoples? <gasps> mind blown. Again, the Megalodon, I think, would just chomp this thing and dive deep down to the Twilight Zone and it's lights out. We've seen Jaws, right? Yeah, picture that, but like 40 times the size. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Number one, Godzilla. I had to, obviously, we're having fun here today. Godzilla, yes, of course, the King of Kings, AKA Kaiju, originates from a series of Japanese films. The character first appeared in the 1954 film Godzilla and became a worldwide pop culture icon ever since. Appearing in a ton of different media, 32 films, four American films, video games, novels, comic books, TV shows, you name it. Godzilla has been, like I said, the king of king of all monsters. Of course, a phrase first used in Godzilla, king of monsters. Godzilla is enormous. It's destructive. It's a prehistoric sea monster awakened and empowered by nuclear radiation. With the nuclear incidents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla doesn't really like nukes. Yeah. The amphibious reptilian monster is basically based around a concept of a dinosaur erect, standing up, very tall. Of course, a bony plated back and tail, and let's not forget the special abilities Godzilla has as well. Atomic heat beams, or as I like to call it, stank breath. Dude had tonsil stones so bad, nuclear energy generates from them. Well, not really, but inside of his body using electromagnetic force to concentrate it into a laser radioactive beam. Amphibious, of course, so it swims and breathes underwater, which is gonna come in handy. Immune to conventional weapons and can regenerate, yeah. And it's massive. Of course, Godzilla was said to average around 150 feet tall. In the American version, Godzilla is like 400 feet tall. Like, just a little bit bigger. This is kind of a no-brainer here, obviously, right? This little sunfish would have nothing on the king. Coming in at number five, we have Titan Triggerfish. These fish are known to be quite aggressive to their prey, and they tend to bite divers who come too close to their nests. These fish are among the largest species of triggerfish, and they are commonly found in lagoons and at reefs deep in the ocean, stretching from Australia to Thailand. Their diet consists of sea urchins, crustaceans, tube worms, and coral. It often feeds by turning over rocks, stirring up sand, and biting off pieces of branching coral. They don't typically feed on other fish, but they've been observed being aggressive and attacking other fish who enter their territory. Along with being aggressive, naturally they get extremely aggressive during the reproduction season when the female is guarding its nest, which is placed in a flat and sandy area and looks roughly cone shaped. If you dive down and come in contact with the female fish near her nest, it will defend its eggs at all costs, often exposing its erect dorsal spine and swimming rapidly towards you to attack. It is suggested to swim horizontally away from the danger zone rather than them going up to the surface right away. Triggerfish can grow up to 30 inches and their size and oval shape make them very recognizable along with their threatening looking teeth and have evolved as an apex predator within their natural habitat. If you're on vacation and are planning to go scuba diving or snorkeling, be careful not to swim near coral reefs because they tend to swim around there and if you get too close, they will attack and bite you. The Titan triggerfish bites are not venomous. They are extremely painful and can cause serious injury. Coming in at number four, 
we have flower urchin. Yes, it has a nice name, but it is anything but that. It is considered to be the most dangerous urchin in the world. This urchin has flower like patterning and are usually a pinkish white to yellowish white colouring with a central purple dot, and that's how it got its beautiful name. They tend to live in coral reefs, seagrass, and sandy environments lower down towards the ocean floor, and it feeds on algae. Bryozoans are an organic detritus and can grow to a maximum diameter of 15 to 20 centimeters. They reside from Japan all the way to Australia and in the Red Sea to the East African coast. Flower urchins are among the numerous species of sea urchins known as collector urchins, and they often cover their upper body with debris from their surroundings to camouflage from others. They're usually covered in objects like dead coral fragments, shells, seaweeds, and rocks. If you just simply touch this creature, it can deliver excruciatingly painful stings that can result in hospitalization. It can cause paralysis of the tongue, lips, eyes, and muscles, faintness, difficulty breathing, and the inability to speak. A scientist named Sutomu Fujiwara, who was once stung by the flower urchin, described feeling like he was going to die. So when in the ocean, beware of your surroundings and make sure not to touch this urchin. Another account of someone being stung by these dangerous creatures was the drowning of a pearl diver after being rendered unconscious from accidental contact with a flower urchin. Again, if you're going to be swimming, snorkeling, or deep sea diving in the ocean, be very careful you don't come into contact with these beautiful yet dangerous creatures. Coming in at number three, we have the blue ringed octopus. This creature is beautiful looking and easily recognizable due to their yellow skin and blue and black rings, but it's one of the deadliest species of small octopus in the ocean. And scientists have even classified them as one of the world's most dangerous animals. To the eye, this creature is beautiful, but their blue and black rings around their bodies change dramatically when they become threatened. Despite only being five to eight inches in size, their venom is extremely powerful and can be very dangerous to humans if they're provoked. If stung, it can result in a number of things such as nausea, respiratory arrest, heart failure, blindness, total body paralysis, and can lead to death within a few minutes if not treated or could cause drowning due to the results of the venom and the inability to swim to the surface. In order to come in contact with the creature's venom, you would have to come into direct contact with the octopus. When faced with danger, the octopus's first instinct is to flee, but if the threat persists, they will then go into a defensive stance and display its blue rings. If the octopus is cornered or touched, the person would be in danger of being bitten and stung by its deadly venom. They are named one of the deadliest sea creatures for a reason, because despite them being such a small animal, they carry enough venom in their bodies to kill up to 26 humans with just a few minutes. Within just a few minutes. These terrifying sea creatures feed crabs, shrimp, and other small animals. They reside in tide pools and coral reefs in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, from Japan to Australia. And their species tend to only live around two to three years, but this may vary based on their nutrition, temperature, and intensity of light. Be extremely careful when in the ocean. Be sure to watch out for these terrifying creatures. They would be easy to see due to their bright colors, but if spotted, swim away fast before you get attacked. Coming in at number two, the box jellyfish. This is a species of jellyfish that usually tops the list of the most dangerous sea creatures in the world, and the world's most venomous creature. At first look, its appearance isn't too threatening, but if stung, it is life-threatening. The sting can result in death in less than five minutes. The most recent death from a box jellyfish sting was in February 2021 to a man who passed away 10 days after being stung while swimming at Cape York Beach in Australia. Before that, the last known fatality was in 2007, and total of 79 deaths since the first report in 18 1983, and that's just in Australia alone. In the Philippines, there are far more fatalities, with up to 40 deaths annually. In Thailand, after a man died in 2014 from a box jellyfish sting, they enhanced their first aid stations on beaches. But yet the next year, two more fatalities occurred due to this deadly sea creature. Unlike some jellyfish, the box jellyfish can swim, which means they're capable of hunting for prey, and can move through the ocean at a very fast pace of up to 8 miles per hour. They actively hunt their prey, which tend to be smaller fish and invertebrates, including prawns and baitfish. Unfortunately, the box jellyfish has many enemies like crabs, different species of turtles, rabbitfish, batfish, and butterfish, but their swift swimming and venomous stings help themselves stay alive. An interesting fact about box jellyfish is that in Hawaii, the number of box jellyfish peak after a full moon, which is apparently when they come near the shore to spawn. So if you're thinking of going for a swim in the ocean during a beautiful full moon, I'd advise to just wait until the next day because you don't want to ruin a nice vacation with a fatal box jellyfish sting. No, no one wants to ruin a vacation by dying. That would suck. 
And finally, in at number one, we have Cone Snail. Just by looking at this little snail sitting in its shell, you wouldn't think it would be dangerous or harmful at all. Their shells are beautiful looking with colourful and complex patterns on its shell, but don't be fooled, you should never handle this snail. It is one of the most venomous sea snails in the ocean. There are over 600 species of these cone snails all around the world and they are extremely toxic. The most dangerous species to humans are the slightly larger ones, but pretty much all cone snails are capable of stinging if handled or stepped on and can be very fatal to humans. Cone snails use a hypodermic needle like modified radula tooth and their toxic venom gland is used to attack and paralyze their prey instantly before eating them. The tooth is hollow and barbed and is attached to the tip of the radula inside the snail's throat. When the snail detects an animal nearby that it wants to feed on, it sends a long flexible tube called a proboscis towards their prey and the radula tooth is loaded with their toxic venom from their venom bulb and is fired into the prey by a powerful muscular contraction. It's like gleeking. They tend to be found in all tropical and subtropical seas in deep areas near rocks and coral reefs. These toxic creatures are carnivorous and predatory and they feed on small bottom dwelling fish, marine worms and even other cone snails. If you're going to swim in the ocean you shouldn't really ever come in contact with these venomous creatures due to them living on the ocean floor. But if they ever wash up on the shore be careful if you're collecting shells from your vacation and make sure you don't pick up any cone shells just in case there's a snail living inside because it could be deadly. Only one drop of their venom can kill up to 20 people. So when swimming in the oceans, be careful and watch out for all these deadly creatures. This is why I never go in the ocean. Everything wants to kill you. Number five, the Kraken. Over the port side, boys, there she blows. Butter down the hatches, the Kraken's there. I'm sorry, I absolutely could not resist. I'm just trying to paint you a picture of the scene here. The Kraken is an absolutely legendary sea monster, harking back to old sailor's tales from the 17th century. It started as an old Nordic legend and was said to haunt the waters from Norway through Iceland. But as its legend grew, stories of the Kraken would be passed throughout the world, carrying on from sea to shining sea. It's widely theorized that the legend of the Kraken began with sightings of the colossal squid, a creature almost as mythical as the Kraken itself. An old fisherman's tale, it's depicted as a colossal cephalopod capable of crushing a fully stacked galleon with its tentacles and bringing it down to the ocean floor. If the tentacles and its heaving beak aren't enough, it also creates whirlpools around it as it drags your doomed ship down with it all the way down to Davy Jones's locker. The Kraken probably has one of the best PR agents in the sea monster community, being the subject of stories, songs for centuries, finding its way into numerous movies, a career making role in Clash of the Titans, a very strong supporting role in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise really helped elevate it to stardom, even finding its way into a bunch of video games over the years, serving as a boss for players in God of War, Sea of Thieves, and for the real OGs out there, RuneScape as well. When it comes down to who could defeat who, it's not even a question. The Megalodon wouldn't get so much as 30 seconds with the Kraken. The Kraken of lore was crushing ships in seconds. You think it's even going to notice crushing a shark? Number four, the Loch Ness Monster. Now, the Loch Ness Monster is probably the most famous sea creature of all time, and probably one of the most famous Scottish things of all time, alongside William Wallace, Kilts, and Haggis. It's also one of the world's oldest recurring cryptid stories, with the first reports of Nessie going all the way back to the year 565. And since then, Nessie has delighted cryptozoologists the world over, becoming a cultural icon for Scotland and the Loch Ness as a whole. There's been several, several concentrated efforts to really find the Loch Ness Monster over the years. And while nothing has ever officially shown up on a sonar or a radar, that has never stopped the stream of sightings and photos of the Loch's gentle giant. Nessie seems pretty benevolent. There's never been a story or an allegation of the Loch Ness Monster eating or hurting anyone, usually just sticking its cute little head out of the water for a quick little blurry candid to be discussed and analyzed for years. Let's talk serious for a second here. In the ring, squaring up in a 1v1, I've absolutely got Nessie over the Megalodon, easy. That long neck is gonna wrap around the Meg, get that thing lassoed. You know, the Meg is big, sure. But the Loch Ness Monster clearly has some stealth capabilities. I mean, it's been eluding capture for the better part of 1,500 years, so I've got to imagine that Nessie's got to know some pretty good tricks for hiding. But more so than anything, Nessie's got the people of Scotland riding for them. You're not just messing with a sea creature megalodon, you're messing with a beloved cultural icon. It would be like going to war against raccoons in Toronto. The people just won't stand for it. Number three, Umbozu, translating to sea priest, is a yokai appearing in Japanese folklore. 
It's depicted as a large, shadowy figure looming out of the water, appearing to sailors, breaking the ship as it rises, and demanding a bucket from whatever unlucky sailor happens to cross its path. Maybe it's got a leak in the roof. There's some differing opinions onto what the origin of the Umubozu is, as there's no specific origin to its legacy or one tale we can point towards. But it's generally agreed that the origin is that they are the spirits of priests who were thrown into the ocean by villagers for one reason or another, and because these priests have had nowhere to lay their bodies to rest, their spirits inhabit the ocean and take the form of a dark specter, haunting and taking retribution on unfortunate souls in the waters. I'd never heard about this creature until researching it for this video, and I've got to say it has got some fantastic folklore. You really should do yourself a favor and look up Umabozu after. The Umabozu rising from the sea and asking if you've got a bucket for it is hilarious. Like it's more of an annoying roommate than a sea monster asking if it can borrow something. Folklore says the Umabozu would cling onto the hull of the ship and shriek at the sailors, sinking them down. The Umabozu's weakness? The smell of smoke, apparently. So if you're looking to get rid of one, light some sage up, I guess, or light something. I'm sure that's very easy to do when you're on a wooden boat in the water. Now, squaring up against the Megalodon. This one, I actually do feel like it could go either way. The Megalodon, giant shark, Umabozu, scary specter. But I am going to give the edge to Umabozu solely because I don't know if it's got an actual tangible physical form or if it's just a shadow monster. You know, Megalodon can't really bite through shadows, I don't think. I don't think that's one of its powers. As well, I could really see Umabozu pulling that little trick, you know, hanging on to the side of the Meg, asking for a bucket, and then the Megalodon, who presumably doesn't speak any languages, not understanding what's happening, gets dragged down to the bottom of the sea, never to be seen again. Number 2. Skyla and Carabitus Skyla and Carabitus are sort of like a wrestling tag team duo as far as mythical sea monsters go. They worked in tandem, hounding opposite sides of a narrow strait of water, and famously clashed with the Argo Odysseus, made famous in Homer's Odyssey. The first beast, Skyla, was described to be a dragon-like creature, having 12 feet, 6 long necks, and atop each neck was a head full of razor sharp teeth. Sailors unlucky enough to pass through Skyla's territory were swooped from their vessel and swallowed hole before they'd even know what would happen. That doesn't sound so bad, you know, all in an instant. There's some speculation that perhaps the original Skyla was a very dramatized account of sailing through an underwater reef, which would definitely provide some explanation as to why a writhing mass of limbs and teeth would be shredding through a ship's hull. But Skyla is only one half of this dynamic duo, the Robin to Batman, and the other half is Carabitus. Carabitus is a little harder to describe, as it has no agreed appearance. In the original myth, the Odyssey, Carabitus presents itself as a whirlpool, savagely swirling around, creating the tides and pulling passing ships into their doom. Maybe it's just a little camera shy and it lets its more handsome sibling take a lot of the front facing business. However, of the two, it could be argued that Carabitus was the more dangerous of the two, as during the Odyssey, Odysseus chose to sail his ship closer to Skyla than Carabitus, figuring that it was wiser to lose six men to lose the entire ship. Very wise guy. Now, the Megalodon. Drop out of this one before you even try. A one-on-one -on -one is one thing, but a duo battle against a whirlpool and a six-headed dragon? Save yourself the embarrassment and just clock out and go home. Number 1. Jormagander Jormagander is another old Nordic sea legend, also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent, and is a serpent so large that its tail would surround the circumference of the earth and all its oceans and loop back around onto itself inside its mouth creating an Ouroboros. This impressive girth is where the creature gets its name, World Serpent. Jormagander's also had a bit of a star-studded run in pop culture, appearing in Marvel Comics and most recently the new God of War based around Nordic legends. Jormagander is fairly central to Nordic mythology, as it was said that when the creature would stop biting its own tail and release it from its jaws, it would be one of the signs of Ragnarok, and the creature would thrash its tail and the seas would rise up and flood Midgard, the Nordic term for their realm. There are several notable myths detailing Thor's many encounters with Jormagander, and his various attempts to overpower the beast and to slay the mighty serpent, although as the myths go, he was never quite successful. Good for me, because I actually don't think I would do too great in Ragnarok. I'm really not much of a fighter, and I don't think I would do well wrestling any Vikings. It's said that when Ragnarok occurs, Thor will slay the mighty serpent, only to find himself defeated by poison from the creature himself. All of this to say is that as far as sea monsters go, there could not possibly be anyone more powerful in lore than Jormagander. All this beast has to do to initiate the end of the world is to take its tail out of its mouth. 
the Neglodon wouldn't be able to challenge this thing. It would literally be over before it began. The Yormagander opens its mouth to start the duel, and that's it. It's done. Not only is the Megalon done, but everything's done. Seas flooding, fires raining down from the heavens. How could there possibly be a more powerful sea monster than this? Unless they update the Nordic myths at all, I doubt anything will ever tap the legend of the Yormagander. Number 5. Dagon and the Deep Ones Coming up first on our list is a multifaceted entry with Dagon and the Deep Ones who worship him. They kind of go together. What is a Deep One? It's not a sea monster that went to first year philosophy and is always trying to wax poetic, but rather a Deep One refers to a race of amphibious, humanoid-like ish sea creatures closely resembling creatures like frogs or axolotls. If you've ever seen Hellboy's Abe Sapien or the monster from Shape of Water, those monsters are actually a pretty good representation for what a Deep One should look like. Deep Ones get their name from their homes, deep, deep beneath the sea, obviously, where they live out their cold, often miserable lives. When Deep Ones do venture to the surface, they do so to sweep humans under their influence, promising them riches in exchange for warship, sometimes even mating with them, creating disgusting hybrid Deep Ones. And first and foremost, to ingratiate them into the cult of Dagon, worshipping their master, Dagon, a massive, massive Deep One of fantastic power. Dagon appears in the short story appropriately named Dagon, which is also a great jumping on point. If you've ever been curious about reading H.P. Lovecraft and you didn't know where to start, it's one of the first appearances of any of the Lovecraft monsters at all. Dagon is worshipped by humans and Deep Ones in equal measure, no doubt thanks to his influence. Dagon is immortal, massive, and commands a lot of respect. It's unknown what the full extent of Dagon's power is, but given that he's an immortal sea monster with dominion over a race of pelagic nightmares that do his every bidding, let's assume that if he really wanted to stir up trouble, it would not be that difficult for him. Just ask the town of Innsmouth how they feel about their master. They've got nothing but positive things to say, I'm sure. And hey, while I got you here, if you're liking what we do, we'd always appreciate a subscribe our way, and you'll catch the best horror videos in your inbox every single day. Number four, the Shogoths. A Shogoth or a Shogoth, I'm really not sure, which does sound a bit like something a 1920s chimney sweep might yell at you to get off. Hey, Shogoth is a disgusting, writhing mess of iridescent black slime and a sea of eyeballs engineered by the Elder Things to function as a race of tools for their will, as they're mostly used for undersea construction. They're amorphous, shape-shifting monstrosities, able to mock and reflect all matter of organ and life. A Shoggoth is capable of molding itself however it needs to see fit to accomplish its dark dealings, which make them the perfect tools for the Elder Things. Now, The first generation of Shoggoths were brainless husks, solely driven to appease their masters, but over the eons of their existence, the Shoggoths began to mutate and develop a low form of consciousness, eventually rising up and overthrowing the Elder Things altogether and working for themselves to build their own cities, where they now reside in their city in Antarctica, poorly imitating their old masters, shrieking, Tikali, Tikali, over and over, an old rallying cry the Elder Things would shout at the Shoggoths to get them to work. Poor, poor little amorphous shape-shifting monstrosities. Now, although a Shoggoth was intended to serve mostly as a being for construction, they're not without their abilities. A Shoggoth is hulkingly strong, capable of crushing a human in seconds, and they're known for using their brute strength to solve problems in their way. For example, the Shoggoth that makes an appearance in the Mountains of Madness crushes an entire rookery of penguins that was in its way beneath its mighty weight. While the Shoggoths don't seem to have any higher goals or aspirations, they've shown themselves to be threatening enough that if crossed, you'll regret ever dismissing them as nothing more than tools. Number 3. Yugonalak Yugonalak is colloquially known as the Defiler, and is more properly known as the god of depravity and perversion which is just about the worst way you can introduce yourself on a first date. Yugalanak isn't just into human perversions, oh no, no, no. This wretched great one has its sights set on something much bigger than anything our little human brains could conjure up. Yugalanak is after depravity on an incomprehensible scale. That's a word that gets thrown around a lot in the Lovecraft mythos, incomprehensible. Yugalanak's true form is unknown, as it seems to exist in a state outside of a physical body. But when it's looking to pursue some of its disgusting pleasures, it always acquires a human host. And when it takes a human host, it warps its body into a wretched, grotesquely obese form, lacking a head or a neck, and featuring a mouth in the palm of both hands. And I cannot imagine that it is getting up to anything good with those palms. 
Yagawa Nak is unlike most other great ones in that it's capable of directly speaking to humans in plain old English instead of indecipherable guttural noises. Its ability to speak English and communicate is what helps it to pursue its dark goals as it seeks out humans who read perverse and forbidden literature and it doesn't just hunt Fifty Shades of Grey fans. It plants seeds of interest in human minds to research and eventually manipulating curious enough humans to read from the revelation of Glocky, a cursed book containing Yagalanak's name. When read, it will be summoned. When Yagalanak is summoned, it makes its guests an offer, offering to make the summoner into a priest of Yagalanak, welcoming them into its service. It's best to accept this gracious offer, as a rejection will offend Yagalanak deeply, leading to the summoner to become its next meal. Unfortunate for you, but either way, Yagawanak is very pleased with the outcome. Either it gets a new servant for its life, or it gets a nice little midday snack. Number 2. Nyarlotep Now, Nyarlotep is one of the most sinister entities in all of the Lovecraft pantheon, and one of the most popular beings as well, appearing across several stories in the universe, both by Lovecraft and other authors over the years. Nyarlotep first appears in the short story, Nyarlotep. Which is also another great jumping on point for new Lovecraft fans who want to get into the lore somewhere and don't know where to start. It's pretty self contained. Nyarlotep is unique in the Pantheon for several reasons, but first and foremost is its freedom. Nyarlotep isn't trapped under the sea or in the stars like Cthulhu or Azathoth, but rather enjoys the freedom of the earth as it wanders. It usually likes taking the form of a man, wandering as a tall, joyous, friendly man all the better for it to influence people with. It's said that Nyarlotep has thousands upon thousands of forms and manifestations, and we can probably safely assume that most of them are horrifying and sanity destroying. Nyarlotep could actually be described as the most human-like of any of the Elder Gods, which makes it all the more threatening. It's able to sway humans easily, gathering cults of personality around it. The original short story in which it appears, Nyarlotep is gaining influence over the populations by wandering the world, performing incredible miracles, claiming to have lived for 27 centuries, winning over the hearts and minds of legions of followers willing to devote themselves completely for Nyarlotep's will. Now, Nyarlotep seems to take a sickening pleasure in driving humans to madness. For Nyarlotep, death isn't the end game, but manipulating and twisting humans, driving them to insanity, that's the thrill. I guess it gets pretty boring being an unending, uh, unstoppable power beyond the stars. You gotta find something to keep the day exciting, right? Merely being around Nyarlotep is enough to make a man sick. Nyarlotep isn't the absolute most powerful entity in the mythos, but it is definitely one of the most nefarious and threatening. Number 1. Yog sothoth oh, it, it doesn't even feel good saying that coming out of the throat. I, I shouldn't be talking about stuff like this. This is, this is above my pay grade. Yog sothoth is a horrifying, unfathomably powerful god, and one of the most powerful gods in the whole mythos. If there's one big takeaway from H.P. Lovecraft's mythos, it's that there's always bigger fish up the food chain. We are so insignificant compared to everything else in the cosmos, but we think ourselves so important. We, the beastly fools of mankind, are dwarfed by the radiant greatness of Cthulhu, but Cthulhu himself is dwarfed by creatures like yogg Sophoth. yogg Sophoth, or Yagi, as his close friends like to call him, is the embodiment of all time and space across the multiverse. yogg Sophoth, like most gods in the Lovecraft pantheon, is an indescribable horror beyond human comprehension, and like Nyarlotep, is known to be able to manifest and take several avatars to better serve its needs. But its most common form is described as that of being a massive, fractally glowing green orbs that continuously merge, separate, and regrow, and an unending, spiraling sea of tentacles, tendrils, and eyes. Yaxothop sees all. As the manifestation of time and space across the multiverse, there is nothing that can escape its gaze. It's wise to the entirety of all knowledge. It tempts humans by offering to impart that knowledge to those foolish enough to try and take advantage of that offer, who will then have their lives utterly destroyed by madness after seeking its favor. The mere sight of Yaxothop in its natural form is enough to destroy the human brain irreparably. Now yogg sothoths goals are just utterly beyond our understanding. It can't even be truly said that yogg sothoth is evil in the manner we understand. Our ideas of morality and good and evil just wouldn't register to a being like this. We're just too small to even begin to comprehend the horrors of the multiverse. And it's best we don't, because the more you try to study something like this, the more your obsession grows, and the more you seal your own fate.